Hello, everyone. Hello. And happy early 4th of July. Amen. I hope we see you all out there. Remember, please, hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. It'll be very hot, very humid, but, you know, we see you every year out there, and we wouldn't have it any other way. So thank you so much for coming out today. When Ramya and I were uh, looking for topics, we both agreed that who doesn't like manatees, right? What's not to like about them? So she has an incredible presentation for you. And as you can see, our officers have, are making the rounds. You're, being, uh, you're gonna see them more often because they do have a little bit more free time in the summer. And they're here just to say hello. No one is in trouble. Uh, not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. They're just here to say hello. If anyone has one a specific question, I uh, encourage you to just step outside and meet them and talk to them if you do have any concerns. Uh, but So I'm just going to let them uh, introduce themselves, say hello, and then Romeo is going to start the presentation. Hi, can everyone hear me? Oh, yeah. Does anyone need the mic? No. no. Oh, okay, no problem. First of all, I'm Officer Sergio Diaz, Key Biscayne Police Department, the greatest police department that there is out there. Yeah. Thanks, thanks. I appreciate that. This is Officer Nero Nieves. Officer Nieves has been here for several years, almost uh, seven years. Seven years. If you don't recognize Officer Nieves, it's a resource officer. Ooh. He is the main point of contact and the number one reason why our kids are safe in our schools. Yeah. 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 It's a we have other SR roles in our private schools, but he takes care of our, of our KA center. So that's why you guys don't see him too much, because he is dedicated to that task, and he's good at it. Um, I'm the village resource officer. It's my job to take care of the big kids. So whenever you guys see me in the village, please come say hi to me, pull my ear, whatever you guys need, I'm here for you guys. Okay? Roxy, when she spoke to you guys, she's going to get me to it. I wanted to talk to you real quick about this weekend's festivities, and she's right. Have fun, have a good time, but please stay hydrated. Be vigilant. If you guys see anything out of the ordinary that's a little suspicious, give us a call. Okay? And that's basically it. Besides that, enjoy your presentation because manatees are important and enjoy your lunch. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. One, one thing, please make sure you register for the hurricane registry, please, and let your friends know that's very important. Because my task is to make sure everybody that doesn't come here to register also so we can keep everybody safe and that everybody knows that we're out there for them. Okay? So what does that do? Is that for communication purposes and warnings and yes. guidance? Yes. Yes. In case if you need any assistance during a hurricane uh, evacuation, that they'll be calling you and so forth. But Roxy has more information and she can explain more into it. Okay? Yeah, so just register and like that, we, everybody knows that we're out there for them. All right? Well, thank you very much. Enjoy your lunches. And whenever you see us, please say hello. hello. And we'll see you on the 4th of July because we'll be here. Oh, we'll be here. All right? Bye. Take care. Thank you, everyone, and thank you, Roxy, and thank you to the uh, VKB police. Um, that was really good information. For those of you that don't know, my name is Ramya. I'm the Director of Environmental Science for the Key Biscayne Community Foundation, and I run their citizen science program. Um, today, I'm here to talk to you about manatees. Um, we have these lectures. Um, we've started doing them, these Lunch and Learns, every month, the last Thursday of the month. Um, and that will continue the entire year. Um, the day might be affected depending on holidays like Thanksgiving or Christmas. Um, so those two months it may be affected, but we're still going to do them those months, just a different Thursday. So just keep an eye out for that. But otherwise, it's always the last Thursday of the month, um, and we're going to continue catering them for you guys. We love that you guys come out for us, and uh, we like showcasing you know, local businesses, local restaurants, um, and teaching you about science. <laughs> So let's get started. Manatees. What I'm gonna, this is just an outline of what I'm gonna talk to you about today. So we're just gonna start with some manatee facts, uh, just 
you know, a lot of this stuff is probably things that you guys know already. Um, some of it might be new to you. Um, we'll talk about the main threats that face manatees and, uh, and then what's being done, what kind of protections are in place, and then, of course, what we can do to help and how we can keep them safe to the best of our abilities. So, manatee facts. Um, manatees are in the order Sirenia, which is based off the word sirens. Um, if you've read uh, the Odyssey, there's the sirens in the Odyssey that you know tempt men to jump off their boats and drown. Um, that's actually kind of where this comes from. Manatees are the basis of the myth of mermaids. Um, when old sailors would be out on their boats, they would see manatees and confuse them for mermaids. And so that's kind of where this connection is to manatees and sirens. They don't sing, unfortunately. <laughs> But um, when you're out at sea for many, many years, or at least even many months, um, and you see a manatee, apparently it may look like a mermaid. Um, they showed up in the fossil record about 50 million years ago, the first uh, manatee relative. Um, so they've been around for quite a while. Um, manatees, specifically, the, the few species of manatees, which I'll get to a little bit more on the next page, um, they only exist in the Atlantic Ocean um, and the connected water bodies. They can be in freshwater or saltwater, most of them. Um, there's three recognized species of manatees that are currently alive. There's one that is extinct. Um, and then there is a related family. They're not in the same order. They're in a different family. Um, but they are called dugongs, and they look very, very similar. And they live in the Pacific and uh, the Indian Ocean. And then all of them, dugongs included, are endangered, with the exception of the one that's extinct, obviously. They're either endangered or listed as threatened. So they can live up to 60 years, but that's specifically in captivity. In the wild, they generally tend to not live past 30 or 40 years. Um, the oldest known manatee was a manatee named Snooty. Um, who lived in captivity until the age of 69. And unfortunately, he didn't actually die of old age. He died because uh, somebody, a maintenance worker, had not properly closed a, a plumbing vent or something in his uh, enclosure, um, and he got stuck in it. And that's how he died. So he died at 69 years old, which is much older than most manatees. We don't know if he would have lived longer than that, unfortunately. But, they are very well taken care of, and they, they do actually, um, they do very well in captivity, even though we don't tend to like to keep them in captivity if we can avoid it. West Indian manatees are the ones that you see around Florida. Um, they are the largest of the living manatee species. They can grow nine to 10 feet and can weigh as much as a, a thousand pounds, but there have been cases where they get up to 13 feet and 3,500 pounds. Um, one of the things that people actually don't realize about manatees is that, unlike whales, they don't have a thick layer of blubber. So they just have skin. It's a thick skin, but they have skin and then muscle underneath. They are basically one giant blob of a muscle. <laughs> um, so it's, they're, they're different than you would expect based on you know, how slow they are and how they look. Manatees in the Florida area specifically were hunted until 1893, and that's when Florida passed their first law protecting them. And then since then, they have passed the Manatee Sanctuary Act, which I'll, I'll discuss later. Um, but they were hunted. Their numbers had gotten very low. It was estimated that they were down to about 1,200 in all of Florida until that was passed. Um, at this point, with the protections, their numbers for, this is, I'm speaking specifically about the West Indian manatee, the one that you guys will see around Florida. Um, their numbers now range in the seven to 8,000 area, um, but they still have a lot, of, uh, a lot of obstacles that they face. So their closest living relative is the elephant. Um, just like you know, dolphins and whales were once four-legged animals that very slowly over time evolved to live in the water. If you look at a manatee's flipper, or a, a dolphin's flipper for that matter, um, you will see fingers. You can kind of see them right here, it's a little bit small. But you see fingers. Too far. Um, if you look very closely, um, I don't think I have, oh I do. You can see that they're little toenails, just like the elephants have toenails. You can see manatees have toenails. Um, the Amazonian manatee, which um, it lives obviously in the Amazon, 
um, does not is the only one that doesn't have toenails, and I think it's just you know because of its size and other reasons. But um, but yeah, so you can see some of the similarities. Um, you can see the 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 whiskers around the nose. Elephants, it's kind of hard to see, but they do actually have a lot of whiskers. Um, now, the other weird kind of thing that many people don't know, um, manatees and elephants have one other close relative, and that is the hyrex. Um, I can't remember where they live. I want to say Africa, but I might be wrong about that. Um, but they are actually a relative. They are not rodents. They are a relative of manatees and elephants. They just went on a very strange evolutionary path and ended up about slightly smaller than a cat. And they look like rodents. They swim. Um, no, no, that's uh, muskrats. I don't think these guys swim. I mean, they might be able to swim, but not. Yeah, they may be able to. I mean, a lot of, you know, if you throw a dog in the water, most of them can swim, but, but it's not part of their physiology normally. Hyrax, it's, it's spelled H-Y-R-A-X. So I just wanted to mention that just because it's a kind of funny factoid. Uh, so these are all of this known species of manatees and dugongs. There's only one species of dugong. Um, so this is the West Indian manatee that we have here around Florida. It is the largest living species. Um, the West African manatee is just a little bit smaller. Dugongs in the Pacific are about the same size, maybe a little bit smaller. Um, and then the Amazonian manatee, which is found only in South America in the Amazon and uh, the, you know, connecting tributaries and things, is the smallest living species. There is some debate about a fifth species or maybe a subspecies of the Amazonian manatee that, that people refer to as the dwarf manatee. And they only get like three or four feet long and like 130 pounds. But that's still up for debate. A lot of people think that they're just juvenile manatees that hang out in this one area and somebody wants to think that they're dwarfs so i don't know are species also alive um all except for this big fat one at the bottom that's the extinct one so the stellar sea cow is the one that is extinct um it was alive within the lifetime of humans it went uh i don't remember exactly when it went extinct i want to say maybe the 1800s it was hunted to extinction um, but yes, all of these are still alive. They're all threatened or endangered. Um, worldwide, the manatee population, this does not include dugongs, the, but the manatee population of all of these, the other three, is estimated to be 13 to 15,000 of all three species all put together. So it's not a very big number. So quickly, I do want to talk about the stellar sea cow, which is the one extinct species. And as you can see from the previous picture, it's huge, way bigger than all the other species. Um, it is the only member that's known to be extinct that, that we know of um, that existed within our, within humans kind of lifetime. Um, they were the first historical extinction of a marine mammal by human beings. They are extinct because of people. They were discovered and within 27 years of their discovery, they were extinct. Um, and it's because they're also the only cold water species. So all of the other ones live in, in tropical and subtropical areas. Stellar sea cows lived in the North Atlantic and the Bering Sea. So very, very cold water. They were also the only ones with a thick layer of blubber like whales. Um, they can grow between, uh, I believe, 20 and 30 feet so very large, larger than some whales even. But they were also just very docile plant-eating sea cows. Um, they were very friendly and very, very easy to hunt. And so what happened was when you had fur traders going up in that way to uh, hunt seals and otters for their pelts, um, they used uh, the sea cows as food because their blubber was very nutritious and um, was a very easy target. And so that's why, and there was no protections at that time for things like this. So that's why they were discovered and, and they were so easy to kill that they were gone in 27 years. Very similar story with the, the dodo bird, actually. No, just people. Yes. Um, manatees do not have any known um, predators, except for people. Um, so, manatee facts. I'm not going to read through all of this. This mostly just describes the size. 
Um, but the West Indian manatee, as I mentioned, is the largest one, and it's found um, around the southern part of the United States and the Caribbean and uh, the northern part of South America and Central America. Uh, the African manatee is found around the west coast of Africa, mostly towards the center of the west coast and a little bit towards the north. Um, the Amazonian manatee is found um, in the Amazon River primarily, um, and then the upper uh, reaches of the tributaries. So you have Brazil, Colombia, Ecuador, Guyana, and Peru. They are the only species that is exclusively freshwater. So they don't go in salt water, but all of the other species can go in freshwater or salt water. Um, the stellar sea cow, as I mentioned, lived in the, um, sorry, I said Atlantic, but I meant North Pacific and the Bering Sea. Um, so very cold water. And then dugongs are in the Western Pacific and the Indian Oceans. Um, I also just wanted to point out this slight difference. So these are the manatees that we're used to. That's what they look like. And they have these big, you know, rounded paddle-like tails. The dugongs have a split tail like a dolphin. And that's just a, you know, evolutionary fluke, if you'll excuse the pun. Um, but that's just, you know, they, they developed in the Pacific and the ones that developed in the Atlantic have the rounded paddle tail for some reason. So, let's talk a little bit about the threats, because we have to. It's sad. Boat strikes. That is the number one killer of manatees anywhere that they live. And, you know, a lot of people, I, I've had this conversation with people where they're like, oh, you know, I mean, obviously a, a boat strike can be devastating. It can break bones um, and cause a lot of, like, internal injuries. But the propellers, in particular, will cut through the skin. And a lot of people don't realize that because manatees don't have a thick layer of blubber the way whales do, that actually affects them much more severely than it would if that were to happen to a whale, getting those propeller cuts. Um, so this is like a, a continuous issue, you know, to the point that in Florida, like 99% of the manatees that are tracked, um, some of them are named, are tracked because at some point in every manatee's life, it will have a propeller mark. So we can tell them all apart. Um, which is, you know, it's great for research because you can tell your manatees apart, but that's a terrible way to have to do it. Um, and it just means that people aren't careful. So, you know, as long as they're not deep, the, the manatees will recover from that. In this case, you can see that um, its tail got hit by a propeller and it lost a huge chunk. But, you know, the manatee, it, it survived that and, and healed eventually. And there are much worse ones. I didn't want to put the really terrible pictures up here. Um, but you can always Google them if you really want to. Um, but it is, it is a huge problem and, and the number one killer of manatees throughout Florida. Um, this picture I added, obviously boat strike, uh, another propeller strike in particular. I, I'm calling these boat strikes, but everything I've been showing you are specifically caused by propellers. The, if, if a manatee is actually hit by a boat, depending on how fast that boat is going, chances are it's, it will die. Um, it can easily break the vertebrae of the manatee, and then they won't be able to swim, they'll drown, obviously, you know, cause a lot of internal damage and everything. So. I didn't want to include those pictures. You guys don't need to see what dead manatees look like. I'm sure we can all imagine it. Um, but these are the other problems is that is propeller strikes, which in this case, these are all manatees that survived the propeller strikes. But uh, sometimes they can be very, very deep and they won't survive that. Um, this picture in particular I wanted to include just as kind of a side note. That fish right there is a placostomus. Those are algae eaters that people buy for their fish tank. They are not native to Florida, and people have been releasing them. And in certain areas, they've become a huge, huge problem um, because they're just proliferating like crazy. And aside from the fact that you know, they're causing problems for the other fish species because they're out competing them and things like that, they are a nuisance to manatees. So I'm sure you've seen a lot of, in a lot of these pictures, and you'll see in you know, more pictures, a lot of these manatees have um, algae growing on their back. That's very common. Sometimes you'll see barnacles because they're slow moving, it's just kind of easy for that stuff to settle on them. A certain amount of algae is totally fine. If anything, it may even be protective. Um, if you see a manatee with too much algae, which I, I will show you later, it's probably sick or it has something wrong with it. Um, the placostomus will clean the algae off, which theoretically is not a problem for the manatee, but what they are is annoying. And they 
sometimes you'll see these manatees with like seven or eight very, very large plecosomas sticking onto their back and trying to like clean the algae off to the point where it annoys the manatee and they'll leave the area. And manatees have to eat 10 to 12% of their body weight every day. Um, they eat seagrasses, which are very low in nutritional value. And so if they don't eat that much, they will start losing weight. They'll get very skinny and it's a, it's a big problem for them. They have to continuously eat. And so if they get annoyed and keep moving away from an area where their food source is, then it creates you know, a secondary problem where they're not eating properly because they can't you know, be in the same room, so to speak, as these like, you know, annoying little things running all over them. Fishing debris and entanglement. I mean, this is a problem for any animal that lives in the ocean, of course. Um, many of you were probably here for my sea turtle lecture back, I think it was April, and that, of course, is a huge problem for them as well. All of these animals, um, well, not all of them, but the ones I've, I've been talking about, they need to breathe. And if they get tangled in something that holds them underwater and they're unable to breathe, then they'll suffocate, they'll die. Turtles need air, manatees need air. And aside from needing air and getting trapped underwater, there are these other issues where you have ropes that'll get tied around their flippers. In this case, this one had, this, this manatee is actually in um, a rehab facility. This picture was taken in a rehab facility, but it had ropes tied around both of its flippers which were in the process, slowly but surely, of amputating its flippers. And that is one of the most common uh, types of injuries that you see in manatees from uh, debris, uh, entanglement issues, a fishing line, things like that. So, you know, discarding a fishing line and fishing hooks and things like that in a way that's not safe causes problems for a lot of animals, but including even really large ones that you think maybe wouldn't have that a problem, but they do. And here you see a manatee with a fishing hook and lure hooked in its mouth. It probably tried to eat some kind of something that was attached to the end. But then also there's a hook here that got hooked into the manatee's foot or his flipper. So he's swimming around this whole time with a hook in its mouth and his flipper just stuck like this. And he can't, so he can't swim properly. And this was what I mentioned earlier. Look at all the algae growing on him. Like he's not doing well. And you can tell because he is absolutely like, like he, it looks like he needs his, to get mowed or something. Um, so that, that's sort of an indicator. Um, here, this is what I was talking about before where you have like uh, ghost ropes, ghost nets, things like that. Um, this manatee is alive, it was saved. Um, but it was you know, completely just wrapped up in fishing line, in, in ropes specifically. Um, just the other day, I, every Thursday, I do sea turtle nest evaluations at Bill Baggs. Um, and uh, I think it was about a month ago, I don't know if any of you guys know Manny who runs Philobag. Um, I was there, I was just finishing up um, in the morning and I ran into him and he asked if uh, me or my partner had a knife or if we could help him. And what happened was he was just out paddling that morning and he found a huge, huge mass of rope that had floated and got stuck on the beach on some of the rocks, uh, kind of towards the lighthouse. And we spent probably an hour and a half like digging up this rope. And um, some of it actually ended up staying because it got buried under a rock and we couldn't get it out. So we were cutting it free and pulling it out. And it probably ended up being three or 400 pounds of rope. It was a huge rope and it was brand new. So somebody like just lost it that week. <laughs> so we're lucky that it washed up on shore rather than just floating around in the water, which is what a lot of them do. And then you get, end up with a lot of different animals, sharks, turtles, manatees, dolphins, fish, whatever. They get stuck in this rope or in these nets and they suffocate. So, um, so that's what's going on here, but he was saved, thankfully. Um, this is a bicycle tire. Um, so, you know, manatees like to get into things. They, like I mentioned with Snooty, he unfortunately, the way he died was he like found an interesting hole in his tank and wanted to investigate and got stuck. This manatee may have just been playing with the tire and it got stuck and they can't swim backwards so he can't get it back over his head and it's past his flippers which would make that difficult anyway. And uh, for a long time actually, the, the, they were tracking this manatee, people were reporting it. Um, the FWC kept coming out to find it to see if they could like get the tire off but he was always gone by the time they got there. And then sometime later, he somehow got the tire off himself or it broke because they found him 
And you can tell he's actually fairly thin in this picture compared to the other really fat manatees that I've been showing. Um, but they found this manatee, and he had a big mark around his middle, but no tire. So he recovered. But that's very rare that they are able to get out of their own entanglements. That's some kind of fluke. But you know, they're just especially being so slow moving, and you know, they don't have thumbs like we do. They can't get themselves out of things. So it's really just, it's up to us to make sure that those things aren't there to begin with. So another huge problem is loss of habitat and their food. So Manatees in particular, as I mentioned, they eat seagrass and they eat a lot of it. They need a lot of seagrass to survive. And there's been a huge problem recently in Florida uh, that where our water quality has been getting worse and worse for various reasons. Um, and it is affecting the seagrass, among other things. Um, in particular, things like use of fertilizers, uh, runoff from stormwater drains, um, any type of chemicals that get into the water, which is, is very, very easy for that to happen. They uh, can affect the growth of seagrass. And, um, and so here we've been having our seagrass has been dying off in mass amounts. And that, of course, is a huge problem for the manatees. If they don't have food, then, you know, like anything else, they starve. So this is a picture of the north part of Biscayne Bay from 2016. So here's the, uh, that's Miami Beach, the Julia Tuttle Causeway. This dark mass in the middle is all seagrass. So when you're out in the water, even if you're just sitting on the beach and you see like dark areas in the water, that's seagrass. Um, or it might be a school of fish. If it moves away, it's a school of fish. If it doesn't, then it's seagrass. Um, but here you can see there's a lot of dark seagrass all around this part of the bay. This was 2016, the very end of 2016. No, no, that's live seagrass. That's just how it looks from the satellite. This is 2011. This one is 2016. And it's cleared out. There's very small patches of seagrass, but that whole dark area, almost entirely gone. And that's in the span of about five years that we lost massive, massive amounts of seagrass. And this shows the progression. This actually, the last picture was this one, 2016. This goes to 2017 to show that it's worse. Um, but here you are back in 2011, and you can see it's slowly progressing and getting worse and worse. And we're just losing enormous amounts of seagrass. And aside from manatees that feed on the seagrass, you also have all kinds of animals that live in seagrass and require that as their own habitat. Um, Seahorses, I don't know if anybody's noticed, like, you know, seahorses are hard to find as it is, but if you go looking for them, seagrass is a really good place to find them. And so when you're losing seagrass like this, you're losing things like seahorses, which I like seahorses, I think they're adorable. So that's, aside from like, the problem for manatees, it's just, it's upsetting. Um, red tide and other toxins. In particular, when I say this, I'm talking about toxic algae. So red tide is called toxic algae. Um, it's kind of like algae. It's, it's a diatom, which is like an individual cell that grows and explodes in, in numbers and causes red tide. Um, you also have, um, we have blue-green algae, which we have no idea what blue-green algae does to um, uh, manatees. But there has been re very recent research. So it's not, it's not entirely known, like well known. And it's still, you know, they're doing a lot more investigation. But blue-green algae, they have found certain types, not all of it. There's a, dozens of different species of blue-green algae. Um, some of them can be toxic to people, but very slowly. So you could go swimming in a pool full of blue-green algae and feel totally fine afterwards and not know. But extended exposure to blue-green algae um, appears to have an effect um, on the brain that can cause issues similar to, or, or can accept, uh, accelerate problems like Lou Gehrig's disease or Alzheimer's or other types of dementia. So it's a, but it's a very long-term process, so you don't really know that it's happening. And you know, in 20 years, if you like suddenly have Alzheimer's, was that natural or was it because you were exposed to blue-green algae over the course of your life? You know, It's hard to know for sure. Um, so that's an, a current area of research that they're looking into, but there does seem to be some uh, correlation there. Um, red tide is uh, what they call a good toxin. And, and I say that 
not meaning that you know there's a such thing as a toxin that's great for you, but uh, the reason it's good is because it affects you immediately. So if you go out on the boat on a boat and there happens to be red tide going on in the water, you will start feeling it on your skin, your throat will get itchy, your eyes will start getting irritated, and you know that there's something going on and you need to get out of there. So that's the only that's the reason it's good is because it tells you right away. So you can save yourself, you can get out. Um, whereas, as I mentioned with the blue-green algae, you have no idea if it's doing anything or not. That being said, manatees don't have a lot of options. If they swim into a huge patch of red tide, they don't know that they swam into it until they're into it. They don't necessarily know that they should turn around and leave. You know, they don't necessarily know the way out of the big you know, patch of red tide. We've, we've had red tide that's shown up in areas like 1,100 miles long. You know, how would you ever know like, where to go to get out of that if you're swimming underwater? And for them also, just swimming into it, obviously it, they, are, they can ingest it very easily. But even if they come up to the air or up to the surface of the water to breathe, they're breathing in that toxin. As I mentioned, you can be up on a boat and it will affect you because the aerosol that comes off of it will get into your lungs and, and bother you or on your skin and bother you. So they come up to the surface to breathe and they then breathe in that aerosol and it gets into their lungs and causes problems and they can't escape it. So, um, the incidences of red tide have been increasing in severity off the coast, the Gulf Coast in particular of Florida. Red tide doesn't survive very well off the East Coast. I, I don't know why exactly. It might be a temperature thing, I'm not really sure. We can get it here, but it's usually very, very, very mild and very quick-lived. Um, but on the Gulf Coast, it stays. It'll show up, it can be huge, and it'll, it can stay for a while. Um, there's some evidence to suggest that increased usage of fertilizers and the channelization of the overflow from Lake Okeechobee, both um, to both coasts, has caused a lot of this problem because Lake Okeechobee is full of fertilizer um, that comes from the sugarcane plantations that are in that area. They just dump everything into Lake Okeechobee. Um, I read an article where they started calling it Lake Guacamole because it was green and like thick, um, and that's just from fertilizer that's in the lake. So what happens is periodically Lake Okeechobee naturally overflows. And in the past what that would do, its natural overflow would like, you know, run over the land, filter through the ground, and then you would have this sheet flow that heads south through Florida and that would feed the Everglades. That's the natural progression of the water that's supposed to happen. But now you have housing and infrastructure and all kinds of things around Lake Okeechobee so they can't allow it to overflow. It'll cause a lot of problems for a lot of people. So instead, when it gets high and it needs to overflow, they've built these channels that go out to the Gulf Coast and out to the, um, the Atlantic Coast. And so when the water gets high, they just shoot the water out these channels. So there's no filtration, there's no like you know sheet flow, there's none of that. So first that affects the water flow in the Everglades, but then also there's, since there's no filtration, that uh, fertilizer is just shot straight out into the ocean. And that is, there's very good evidence to show that that is affecting the um, incidence of red tide, especially, as I mentioned, in the Gulf. So red tide causes manatees to become weak and unresponsive. The same thing would happen to you if you went swimming in it. It affects them, they're, they're mammals like us, so we, we would be affected the same way. Um, and they can have seizures um, and all kinds of other neurological problems caused by red tide. A lot of manatees have been like saved and rehabilitated when they're found, but um, this was in Pinellas County. These two officers, uh, these are actually sheriff's officers, they're not even wildlife officers, but they were told about a manatee in distress and they came and you can see that they, they tied a rope around it on both sides and they helped to pull this manatee out and take it to a rehabilitation center. You can see from like what's going on, all this crap on its back, it's, it's kind of not really doing that well, um, but this one in particular was in distress because of red tide. It, it, it lived. I don't like to put dead animals in my presentations because it's depressing for me. I already have to talk about it. So the other problems that these cause, and this isn't just red tide now, we're talking about blue-green algae or other chemicals or other things that get into the water. You can have mass die-offs of fish and that can also cause mass die-offs of seagrass. And this is a picture from 2021, August, when we like, had a huge, huge uh, die-off. Thousands of fish, tons, you can see all the seagrass that's mixed in with all the dead fish. And this was due to um, 
Well, they're still actually investigating it. Initially, it was, they assumed it was because of an algae outbreak. What happens um, that affects fish is you have a huge algae outbreak, um, or an algae bloom is what they call it. And then what happens is the, the algae blooms, it runs out of food, and then it starts to die. And as it dies, the bacteria that breaks down the algae uses up all of the oxygen in the water. And so then all of these fish that need the oxygen in the water to breathe, they suffocate and they die. So it causes a huge anoxic area, which means an area that is lacking oxygen. Um, however, in this case, the evidence the, that they're researching right now, the evidence is showing that while it was caused by a toxic algae bloom, it was because the algae gave off um, sulfuric acid, or sulfuric acid, H2S, I believe that's sulfuric acid. Um, so that's actually what killed everything. And, and also what would have killed the seagrass. So, you know, when we have huge seagrass die-offs based on like algae blooms, also chemicals getting into the water cause very unhealthy water quality. So the seagrass just doesn't grow well to begin with. Then you have those pictures I was showing you earlier where all you have this mass seagrass die-off, like all of that seagrass is just gone from the bay. So this is um, a graph that I made based on the numbers reported by Florida Fish and Wildlife for ma manatee mortality. Um, so this goes, it starts in 2000 and goes up to this year. So these last numbers are preliminary numbers. Obviously, we're only halfway through the year, so those numbers will change. Um, 2021 was an abnormal mortality event. Um, we lost 1,100 manatees that year, and that was the year after, or a couple years after, they were delisted from being endangered. They were changed to threatened, which just, they, and they did that because their numbers were better, or they were looking like they were doing well, so they were like, okay, we can actually change their rating from endangered to threatened. And then just a couple years later, they had this massive die-off where 1,100 of them. And here you can see, so this red line is deaths specifically caused by red tide that were confirmed to be caused by red tide. And then these are just deaths in general. And you can see here, like, there's a huge red tide, and then that correlates to a big die-off. We don't have the red tide numbers for 2010. I don't know why. Um, and then here, there's another uh, red, red tide spike, and then there's a spike in the deaths. If you were to take those spikes out, these numbers would be probably in line with, with the line that's going on there. But here, uh, 2021, there's not a huge spike in red tide deaths, but there's a huge spike in manatee mortality, enormous spike. It was something like, I think, 15% of the population died that year. And the reason for that was seagrass die-off. They were starving. So a few other issues like, that can obviously affect manatees, climate change. Climate change affects us, it affects everybody. Um, you know, increasing uh, weather phenomenon, hurricanes, severe weather, things like that, obviously that can affect anybody. Hurricane Irma, when it came through, stranded a lot of manatees. It created a lot of areas where the water had risen, and manatees swam into places where they shouldn't be because they don't know any better, and then the waters receded and they were trapped. And that happened with dozens and dozens of manatees. Um, they can also be misplaced. Um, I can't remember where it was, but I saw a news article after Irma where a manatee showed up on a Caribbean island where there hadn't been manatees in years. And it just showed up there because it somehow got pushed by the water or waves or something and got displaced. Um, I don't remember if they rescued that one or not, but I know they were looking for it to try. Um, but also, aside from increased storms, you have um, changes, drastic changes in weather patterns. And cold stunning is becoming a, a bigger problem. So you have hotter hots, and colder colds. And cold stunning for a warm-blooded animal can, uh, can be deadly. Um, manatees are warm-blooded just like us. If you are thrown into any type of water that is below your regular water temperature, you start leaching heat into the water. And you will suffer from hypothermia within a certain amount of time. The same thing can happen to manatees. They don't have a protective layer of blubber, so they can lose heat through their skin. So they will like to, they, that's why they live in subtropical areas, because they need the warmer water. But when we have this increased, these like weird weather patterns that happen very suddenly, you know, a sudden dip in the water temperature can be fatal to them. So what's being done? 
Um, I'm not going to address climate change in what's being done because it's up for debate what's being done about climate change. So currently, as far as laws, there are two federal laws in place that protect manatees and our state law. So there's the Marine Mammal Protection Act of 1972, um, and that protects manatees and whales and dolphins and anything you know, like that. Um, and then there's the Endangered Species Act of 1973, um, that also, because manatees are endangered, even though they've been delisted to threatened, they still fall under the Endangered Species Act, and they have most of the same protections as if they were listed as endangered. So they're, they're protected under both of those, um, those statutes. And then in the state, we have the Florida Manatee Sanctuary Act of 1978 that is what's currently uh, protecting manatees here. Uh, we, they did, as I mentioned earlier, Florida did pass a law back in 1893 that protected manatees, and that's what stopped the hunting. But this uh, newer law is what's been helping theoretically build their numbers back. The state of Florida, we also, I'm sure many of you have seen, we have things like mandatory slow boat zones or no wake zones, manatee zones, essentially. So any place where manatees travel or, um, or are, regu are there regularly or seasonally, um, there are signs that tell boaters to go slow and to watch out for manatees. And this, of course, is to try to help protect them against propeller and boat strikes. Um, they have helped. Since those have been put in place, they have helped reduce the number of boat strikes. But obviously, boat strikes are still a huge problem because there are a lot of people that don't, don't listen. And sometimes it's unavoidable. You know, you don't see the manatee until it surfaces and you might already be on top of it without realizing it. There, you know, there are certain ways that it's just maybe unavoidable, but at the same time, having those there, and if your boat is already going slow, you're going to do, at the very least, less damage if you do hit a manatee. Um, in my opinion, completely my opinion, the, uh, the fines and the jail time that you get for violating these laws is way too light. Um, but I mean, I think that's true for, for a lot of things. You know, the, when it comes to animals, it's just not as big of a priority than you know, doing harm to humans. And you know, it, that, that is slowly changing in a lot of states. Um, hopefully, we'll get there eventually. But currently in Florida, the <coughs> sorry, um, if you violate the state law and harass manatees um, or do anything to them, you can be fined $500 or imprisonment up to two months. Um, if you violate the federal law, you can be uh, fined up to $100,000 and get a year in jail. Um, it's not common that people actually get these punishments, but those are the possible punishments. Um, it just depends on the severity of the act of the person and you know, whether it was deliberate or not. Um, all, all kinds of things kind of factor into that. But hopefully, you know, they'll, they'll kind of... Sea turtles, for instance, um, if you steal sea turtle eggs, you can be fined up to $100 for each egg found in your possession. And then an, another $100,000 on top of that for disturbing the nest and uh, a few other things. So like those, and I think you can get more time in jail than a, a year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so, you know, sea turtles have, you know, their, and, and that's federal law, but, but their protections are a little bit more and hopefully a little bit scarier for people who might, you know, do something to a sea turtle. I'm hoping that eventually manatees will get those same types of protections. 2021, the um, unusual mortality event where we lost 1,100 manatees was due almost entirely to loss of seagrass. They were starving to death and they were just dying left and right because there just wasn't enough food. So in that year, or the next year, they started a feeding program um, where literally, and, and don't do this at home, you're not allowed to, it's done specifically by the FWC and other state agencies that are trained to do this. We also, the problem with this is that, you know, they have to do it carefully because they don't want manatees to get used to humans. And a lot of them already are. Um, but people are not allowed to interact with manatees. If a manatee comes up to you and interacts with you, that's fine, but you're not allowed to do anything to the manatee at all. Um, and they're very friendly. Some of them are super friendly and they like want to be your best friend, so it's hard not to like, pet it or something, you know, but you're not supposed to. And feeding it is a super, super big no-no, um, unless you work for one of these agencies that is doing the feeding program. But at the very least, this feeding program has seemingly stemmed some of the mortality rates. 
Um, you know, there was a huge spike in 2021. The seagrass isn't really doing better since then, but the mortality rates have come down from there. So the, the feeding program seems to be helping. They're hoping that eventually, you know, as they continue to work on the various parts of the bay and water quality and all this stuff, that we can get the seagrass back and that they can stop the feeding program. But that still remains to be seen because they st we're continuing to do it into 2023. Um, to keep track of manatees, we have aerial surveys. Um, that's the main way that they, they get counts of manatees. It's also how they can keep track of who they're looking at. They get pictures of all the manatees and you can see all their propeller marks so you can count individual manatees. Um, they also, uh, the FWC uses uh, these tracking devices that they tie around the tail. Um, and that can help learn like manatees movements throughout an area, you know, how deep they're going, how fast they're going, where they go and what, what time of year, you know, so you can kind of get an idea of like what, what manatees are doing and why. Um, these tracking devices are, they break off very, very easily. So if that was to get snagged on something, it would break immediately. And then they do also come off on their own after a certain amount of time regardless. Um, so they make them very like easily break away. Just, you know, obviously they don't want to create a problem as they're trying to solve a problem. And I mentioned this already, the manatee speed zones, slow speed manatee zone. These are the types of uh, uh, signs that you'll see all over the place. Um, you'll also see uh, signs that just say no wake zone. That is for a number of reasons, but manatees are one of the reasons that you have no wake zones. So even if it doesn't have, if it doesn't say manatee on it, it doesn't matter. It's still there protecting manatees, at least in part. Um, but these are just some of the groups, or some, well, a couple of the groups, Save the Manatee Club, Friends of Manatee Lagoon, um, that have educational programs to, and have different ways of people to get involved. You can sponsor manatees. Um, some of them, you can volunteer with them, things like that. There's a lot more. I just didn't want to list everything out. Um, November is Manatee Awareness Month. Um, so, I mean, you know, everybody needs a month, I guess. There's Earth Month and there's whatever, but um, it helps. It helps get manatees on people's radar. And so they actually will make an effort to learn about them and care about them and, you know, hopefully do something to help their situation. Um, there is this documentary. I have not seen it, but I was told by a friend of mine that it's pretty good. So that might be worth watching. I think you can just stream it on YouTube. Um, but I just thought I'd throw that in there because I plan to watch it. And then rehabilitation. So uh, there are a lot of places throughout Florida that do manatee rehabilitation. As I mentioned, there's a number of reasons that a manatee may need rehabilitation. They're, um, you know, if they have line wrapped around their flipper and it's like, you know, getting amputated or any other kind of entanglement that causes injury, they'll need to be rehabilitated. You have orphans that lose their mother for one reason or another. They need to be uh, raised in captivity until they can be released because they won't survive on their own. Manatee calves stay with their mother for two years. And so if they lose their mother within that period of time, depending on how close they are to the two year mark, they probably won't survive on their own. Um, the, the manatees that were affected by red tide and rescued, they can be rehabilitated and released. It just takes them some time to get the, the toxins out of their system, but they can survive if they are rescued and taken out of that situation. Um, and you know, at boat strikes, propeller strikes, things like that, they can survive those depending on the severity um, and be rehabilitated and released. And to date, there's been thousands of manatees that have been rehabilitated and released within Florida. And these are just some of the places that do Miami, or sorry, that do uh, manatee rehabilitation. Um, manatees are solitary animals. They tend to live on their own. Uh, when mothers have calves for the two years, then that's really the only time they're not solitary. You will see this kind of thing where you see a lot of manatees in one area. Um, Crystal River is a good place to see that. Um, this is, I want to say somewhere in like Tampa Bay or something, um, and it's right outside of a power plant. And the reason that you'll see manatees congregate like this is for warmth. So they go up into Crystal River and other rivers like that during the winter because the river waters are warmer than the ocean waters. And so they end up with a lot of manatees in a small area. In this case, the power plant releases very warm water um, that they use in their cooling ducts 
um, to like cool down their systems, and then that, that water ends up being warm because it's taking the heat out, and then they release that water, so it creates a warm area where they can come and hang out. And so when you have cold snaps and cold spells, you'll see manatees grouped like this in areas where they can get warm water. And, uh, and as you may have noticed, there's a lot of sharks there too. <laughs> um, uh, it's probably the same reason they're looking for warmth. Um, and, uh, and as you notice, they were all just coexisting though. Sharks weren't doing anything to the manatees. They don't, they don't try to hunt them or anything. They're too big. Even though there was like a few hundred sharks at least, if they all attacked one manatee, they could probably do some damage, but, but they don't try. Um, but yeah, probably the same reason. They're looking for warmth. It was, that video was taken during a particularly bad cold spell. And so sharks, they, they would eat a dead manatee, but they won't attack a live one. Not like they would live fish or something like that. Sharks don't regulate their body temperature very well, so if it gets too cold, they can also be affected. So finally, what we can do, there's not really much we can do other than just be responsible humans. Um, first of all, if you see a distressed manatee, if you see something tangled, or you see a, an orphaned calf, or anything like that, then um, you can always report it. You can call uh, the FWC um, alert, wildlife alert, and let them know what's, what's going on, or you can report it online. And that's always, and this works for any kind of wildlife that is distressed. So if sea turtles or gopher tortoises, you know, whatever you happen to find, the wildlife alert is the best way to report what's going on and have somebody come out and help that distressed animal. And then of course, just being, as I mentioned, a responsible person. Practice safe fishing and always discard of your trash and plastic safely. Um, your fishing line and your fishing hooks. Don't just leave them and assume that like it doesn't matter because it always does. Can you go back to that? Oh, sure. Telephone number. Please. There you go. Um, manatees have also, I didn't really get into it much because it's not a huge problem, but it is a problem. Manatees have been known to occasionally accidentally eat plastic pollution. And um, they, you know, have to go into rehabilitation because their stomachs will fill with plastic and they're essentially starving even though they have a full stomach. And so that is another reason that manatees have had to be rehabilitated. It's not as big of a problem as the other things that I mentioned, but that is something that matters. So that's another reason to be responsible with your plastic trash as well. Why does... There we go. Um, reduce your use of lawn fertilizer. That's one of the main reasons that um, seagrass is dying off. It's a huge problem. The water quality issues that Florida has are way worse than they could be if people were just a little bit more responsible with their use of chemicals and fertilizers and things like that, and pesticides. Um, boat, boating with vigilance and being careful about harassing wildlife. Um, so obviously boating with vigilance, you don't want to hit manatees with your boat or your propeller and injure them. But also, if you see manatees in the water, don't just approach them with your boat, don't circle them, don't do things that will, f yeah, um, watering them with a hose is actually illegal. Um, touching them, as I mentioned, even if they're coming up to you and being playful, you're not allowed to touch them. Uh, the f feeding is only left to the wildlife experts who are doing that, so we can't, you know, you shouldn't do that. Um, it can be very difficult sometimes, especially, I, I had a friend who went um, kayaking or something in Crystal River, and she had a manatee literally just climbing up on her kayak. And she's just like, I don't know what to do, I can't touch it, but I'm gonna sink if I don't do something, you know? And some of them are just so like friendly and interested, and it's very hard to avoid doing this, but, but it's just things to keep in mind. To your best ability, try not to do things that will get them too used to people, or that they may find annoying. Um, one of the things that happens, um, and people will think it's a manatee in distress, is during mating season, you will have several males trying to mate with a single female. And so you'll see a lot of kind of tussling and like a whole you know, bunch of them kind of rolling around the water. And it may seem like a manatee fight or something. Um, and people have reported that as a manatee that's distressed. Or because they're curious, they'll bring their boat or their paddle board or something right up to it. And like, you know, they're just right on top of the whole area. and that will distract the manatees, that will bother them. They may leave, they may not mate. And obviously that's a problem. You want them to mate, we want more of them. <laughs> so, you know, so it's just a matter of just using your best judgment. 
Um, oh, oh, right, of course. And of course, civic engagement. Talk to your legislators. Tell them that we need you know, stricter punishments and better water quality. And like, we need to try harder to make things better. Um, you know, pestering your legislators. I like doing it. So it's, uh, it's a good way to relieve stress. Um, OK, I believe that is all I have. So any questions? Yes. Uh, they will generally have one calf. Yes. Uh, so they gestate for about 13 months and usually will have one calf. Occasionally you may see a manatee with two calves. It is possible for them to have twins. It's extremely rare. Um, but So usually one calf after gestating for 13 months and then as I mentioned that calf will stay with the mother for two years before it goes off on its own. Yes. What about seagrass? Um, I know that that's something that people have talked about. Um, it's not the easiest thing because you have to be able to grow seagrass in order to outplant it. And the problem is that the reason the seagrass isn't growing is because of bad water quality. So until the water quality is cleared up, there's not really much else that you can do. Um, and the thing is, once the water quality is better, um, the seagrass will, will grow back right away. They're like weeds, you know? They'll just continue to, to, to keep growing back if, if they're able to. Yes. No, no. Sargassum is a different type of seaweed. It's it's a pelagic seaweed, which means it floats in the open water. Normally, it's you know you don't really get a lot of it. I mean, well, we get a lot of it, but um, it's not something. It, it grows out in the middle of the Atlantic where manatees don't live, and then you get these bits that break off of from the Sargasso Sea or from the big floating mass of sargassum that's out in the Atlantic, and that's what floats up on our shores. But it's not something that, um, that they see as a food source. And so it's not really something that they would eat, unfortunately. Which, honestly, that would solve a lot of problems for them and for us if they would eat it. What about the uh, arsenic in sargassum? sargassum? What about it? Would that be toxic to the I mean, yeah, it, it, it probably would be. I mean, they, they don't eat it anyway. But it, it, it likely would be toxic. Um, there, is, there is quite a bit of, or there can be quite a bit of, of arsenic in Sargassum, but they, they don't eat it anyway. Not a lot of animals do, actually. Um, it, it's not really, it just looks like algae. It, it doesn't look like anything specific. Um, it's all over the place. Uh, we, have, we have a blue-green algae task force that does testing out in Biscayne Bay. And we have, we have different types of blue-green algae that grows there. We have it that growing in the Atlantic. Um, as I mentioned, there are dozens of different species of blue-green algae, and only some of them are toxic but they all kind of grow at the same time. So it's just a matter of testing and knowing kind of what's going on. And that's what the, uh, the Florida Blue Green Algae Task Force does. Yeah, they have a website. You can always check there and see what's going on because they post all of their results. Well, they, they spread out a lot more. So in the, in the winter, they congregate towards South Florida more so. And so even in, in the summer when it's warmer, they'll still be in Florida, but farther north in Florida or along the Gulf. Um, and then, yeah, you do have some that go past Florida and even farther north. No, it's just that when it warms up in the summertime, they can just travel farther. There's more areas that they can find seagrass. You know, there's all kinds of reasons that they may travel because the water is warmer. Um, you know, it's, I, it's unlikely that, you know, it's so hot here that they can't stand it or anything. Um, but it may get to that point at some point in the future. All right. Well, thank you guys for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Just